the first drug war passed in Australia, but for emergency crisis as well. The drug war began with the process of colonisation. The current measures are based on fear. Hi, my name's Nick and this is my colleague Lily. We both work at uh, Harm Reduction Victoria. So Harm Reduction is a philosophy which the fundamentals of it are, it's an acknowledgement that people um, use drugs. So where people are using drugs, the idea is that we keep them safe and that's about reducing the harms. And so our organisation is focused on reducing harms related to drug use. I think one of the really important things about harm reduction is it's a peer-to-peer -peer practice. Our work means that we're working directly with community, but it's not just the community in Victoria. Harm reduction is a global movement. So we speak to people from around the world when they come to Melbourne, uh, drop in our offices and come have a chat with, uh, with the staff here. We recently caught up with Professor Monique Marks from Durban University in South Africa. The first time that I'd ever heard of Durban. I don't know if you're I've familiar. I've been to Durban. Oh, well, there you go. Yeah. Uh, but now I learned something new about South Africa. And in fact, I learned a lot more about South Africa and South Africa's drug, drug policies. Because South Africa is such a highly racialized society, what happens is that people quickly attach a social problem to a particular race group. Because I think that you know, the, the physical walls that we build, which exclude people in a variety of different ways um, by saying, you know, stay out, um, are informed by the metaphysical walls which we have. And, and that's usually in relation to people that we, that we see as not deserving of access into particular spaces. And then, of course, there's the, the very false distinction between licit and illicit drugs. You know, when a lot of people are struggling with opiate use uh, disorders that are licit uh, and are not that different from people that are struggling with illicit drug use. So, you know, we make these distinctions all the time. We need to stop doing that. What happens with the drug use community is that there's a sort of uh, cohesion that exists that doesn't see those kinds of divides. Because the more we, we break down those barriers, and that's where the walls come up mm. again, the more we begin to get people beginning to relate to each other in a much more human way. And in that way, I think we need to learn from the drug use community to take ourselves out of this sort of need to disaggregate um, in ways that actually don't make sense to the drug use community and say, okay, this is, this is a problem that permeates all, you know, all different divides. And I think the other one, which, which I feel really strongly about, is to, you know, stop seeing this as a working class, underclass issue mm -hmm. and to really understand that this is a middle class phenomenon. Mm -hmm. It may look different in the middle class, but it's the same. What we have had in the last 10 years is a definite increase in the use of opiates. And, um, and that is only now being recognized by government as a serious, as a serious growing problem. So that's mainly smoked rather than injected. Right. But the levels of injecting are increasing. There are zero harm reduction services that, in terms of state-delivered services, mm. none. They're all given by the NGO sector. So the needle syringe programs are constantly under threat. Um, and in Durban, the needle syringe program has been closed down for the past two years. The infection rates have increased quite significantly mm. within the injecting drug use community. Um, so we do know that the hepatitis levels are, are on the increase. I think they're roughly 80% now of injecting drug users right. have hepatitis C. So there's, there's A, the belief that, that if you provide clean needles and syringes, you encourage, you encourage injecting drug use, but also because people are concerned about the safe um, disposal of needles and syringes. Sort of moral panic emerged when there was a tidal wave and there were a whole lot of needles and syringes that were found on the beach front. And that, that was then blamed on TBHIV care who were the providers of the needle syringe program. Mm. Whether in fact that is where the needles and syringes come from, we don't know because there's a medical hospital directly across the road known for its very poor medical dispo waste disposal. So now what we've, we've done and we're still waiting to sort of reenact the the needle syringe program in Durban which has now been given the go-ahead by the city but is now being blocked by the Department of <laughs> Health but we have got the funders to change the color of the syringes so that it then makes the NGO more accountable to government yeah. and the government not so much able to blame the NGO world. 
You know, the truth of the matter is, and we don't like to talk about this, but I think we have to, is that often, you know, people are not responsible in their disposal. And I think that it's really important that we begin to sort of create a new sensibility amongst people who are using that service to say this is a service that you need to, you know, respect. And and, and respecting that means, you know, doing stuff that doesn't threaten the Mm. potential ongoing um, implementation. What has happened certainly is with the closure of the program is it's also made the user community much more conscious of the benefits that they were receiving from the NGO world. People who are more active in the network are beginning to think about how do we develop sort of uh, harm reduction activists who are able to network with other like organizations who are able to sort of mobilize people in a way that doesn't just leave them uh, with nothing but really allows them to feel very much part of a organization that is sort of functional and equipped um, and also gives people the knowledge with which they can go out and speak to people without feeling uh, intimidated or feeling like what they're saying doesn't make sense. It's giving people the sort of space to talk about things which are otherwise hidden but are, are you know are not invisible and um, and it's it's giving visibility and allowing people to feel that there's no shame but so I think these are really important conversations that we should be facilitating but they have to be you know they have to be sort of ground level activists that are doing this kind of work Absolutely. in a very informed way An announcement was made uh, just last week from Harm Reduction International. So they hold annual uh, conferences yep. all around the world. And now it's coming to Melbourne. Harm Reduction Victoria, we're partnering with Harm Reduction International. So we're one of the support partners. So we'll be doing lots of the behind the scenes work to make sure the conference is a success. So I guess the best way to keep uh, up to date with everything that's going on at Harm Reduction Victoria is to become a member at hrvic.org.au. Uh, link should be on the screen there. Uh, and you can sign up and then you'll start receiving our uh, quarterly magazine as well. Uh, And you can also sign up and watch us on social media. Uh, We've also got a YouTube channel, which this is probably on right now. See you later. See ya. (laughs)